Say I have a function f of x that looks something like this graph, where I've plotted the value of x on the horizontal axis and the value of f of x on the vertical axis. Suppose I want to determine the behavior of this function. Is it increasing at a certain point like x0 over here, or is it decreasing? In that case, I could determine the derivative of f of x, df by dx, and evaluate it at this point x0. If df by dx is positive, then f of x is increasing at x0. If df by dx is negative, then f of x is decreasing at x0. And what if I wanted to go further and determine whether the derivative of f of x was increasing? In other words, what if I wanted to find the concavity of f of x? In that case, I could go one step further with my differentiation and determine the second derivative of f with respect to x. And if I were really ambitious, I could take higher order derivatives like the third, fourth derivatives, nth derivatives, etc. Let's also take one of these higher order derivatives like the nth derivative for instance. In order to obtain this higher order derivative, I need to differentiate f of x n times where n is some natural number. Just note that this nth derivative of f is not the same as raising the derivative of f to the power n. The nth derivative of f is obtained by differentiating f of x n times. It's different from df by dx to the power n. But this is all just basic calculus that you probably know from calculus 1 in your undergrad or perhaps even from high school. But this video is about a more advanced subject. Given what we already know about the nth derivative of the function f of x, it now becomes reasonable for me to ask the question, what if instead of the first, second, third derivatives, etc., what if I were interested in the half derivative or the one-third derivative of f of x? Again, as mentioned above, this is not the derivative of f of x to the power one-half or one-third. It's the half or third derivative of f. So if I differentiate f half times or one-third times, well, in that case, for derivatives with a fractional order, I would then have to use the techniques of a new branch of calculus called fractional calculus, and that's what I'll introduce in this video. Fractional calculus allows us to take half derivatives and even half integrals for that matter, and comes in handy in areas of physics and engineering. For the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the fractional derivative, which is really one of the most important ideas behind fractional calculus, and as you'll see in future videos, it's also quite controversial. To introduce the idea of the fractional derivative, I'm going to discuss three standard functions, the exponential e to the kx, the sine of kx, and your regular x to the power k. And I'm going to use these three columns to separate out my discussion of these individual functions. Note here that k is just a constant, it's a real constant. So let's start off with the exponential function by taking natural number derivatives. The first derivative is k e to the kx via the chain rule. The second derivative is k squared e to the kx. The third is k cubed e to the kx. And if we extend this logic to the nth derivative, we'll see that the nth derivative of e to the kx is k to the n times e to the kx. Note here that n is a natural number equal to the order that we've differentiated the function. But we're not babies anymore. We're past calculus one. We're all grown up, which means that we don't care about the natural number derivative. We care about the fractional derivative. In this case, we can easily establish the fractional derivative of e to the kx as k to the power a times e to the kx, where a is our so-called fractional order. Note here that we're just extending the logic of the nth derivative of e to the kx to now a fractional order a. Now, in general, a can be any complex number, so it's not really fractions we're restricted to. The restriction with this definition, though, is that both k and x cannot be negative. The reason for this is that if we let x or k be negative, then we'll run into problems as far as the uniqueness of our fractional derivative definition goes. Let me go on the side to show you why. Say we're taking the half derivative of e to the negative x, so k is negative 1 and a is 1 half. The value of this half derivative according to our current definition is negative 1 to the half times e to the negative x. But negative 1 to the power half can be i or negative i, where i is the imaginary number, and we don't know which one to pick. We can't pick both since that would mean our definition isn't unique. You'd get two different answers for the exact same fractional derivative method. So for this reason, we're restricting both x and k to be non-negative, and if we end up taking roots, we're only picking the positive roots for now. In later videos, provided people are interested, we'll extend this definition to include negative k and negative x. Anyway, let's find the fractional derivative of the sine function with respect to x. The first derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative after is 
negative sine. And then the third derivative is negative cosine. Of course, the k also comes out every time you differentiate the function according to the chain rule. Now from these three derivatives, it's kind of difficult to write a simple formula for the nth derivative just by looking at them. I don't have a way to say that, okay, cosine for the first, fourth, etc. derivatives, negative sine for the second, fifth, and so on derivatives, and then negative cosine for these derivatives. However, I can express cosine of kx in terms of sine kx by using the fact that cosine is just sine shifted by pi by two radians on the x-axis. Similarly, negative sine is shifted back by pi, negative cosine is shifted back by three pi by two, and so on. So in general, the nth derivative of sine kx is k to the n times sine kx plus n pi over two, where n is a natural number. If we extend this to the fractional derivative setting, the fractional derivative of sine kx of order a would be k to the a times sine kx plus a pi by two, where a is some complex number. Again, both x and k are non-negative in this definition. Let's now move to the third column, where we'll find the fractional derivative of x to the k. Recall that the first derivative is k times x to the k minus one, just from basic calculus one, and the second and third derivatives are found by moving the exponent down and then decreasing the power on x by one. You should be all familiar with this rule. Pretty simple pattern. Now in general, the nth derivative of x to the k is k times k minus one times all the way to k minus n plus one, multiplied by x to the k minus n. And this is where things get interesting because now we're gonna go on a detour and revisit the gamma function. I put a link to my gamma function video in the description. Recall that the gamma function is basically a generalized factorial defined by this integral. Of course, z cannot be a negative integer in this definition. Now the reason I bring up the gamma function is that it has one important property we're gonna highlight, which is that gamma of z plus one is z times gamma of z. Let's apply this property to the coefficient we have on the nth derivative of x to the k. We'll do this by looking at gamma of k plus one. Now by this property, this should equal k times gamma of k, which should equal k times k minus one times gamma of k minus one. See where I'm going with this? Because well, eventually we'll get k times k minus one all the way to k minus n plus one times gamma of k minus n plus one. And if we isolate the expanded out terms in the parentheses, we'll find that k times k minus one times all the way to k minus n plus one is gamma of one plus k divided by gamma of one plus k minus n. And finally, if we plug this into the expression for the nth derivative of x to the k, so that I can get rid of this coefficient and put in a more closed form simple expression, this is what we get for the nth derivative of x to the k in terms of the gamma function. Now in the fractional calculus world, if we replace n by a fractional order a to find the fractional derivative of x to the k, so if we extend the logic from the nth derivative of x to the k to a fractional order derivative, we can say that the a-th order fractional derivative of x to the k will be this, where the n in that gamma expression is replaced by a, and instead of x to the k minus n, you have x to the k minus a. Now of course x and k cannot be negative and k absolutely cannot be a negative integer because that would make our gamma of k plus one in the numerator undefined. So now we have three formulas for the fractional derivatives of different functions, the exponential, the sine, and x to the k. These three formulas each give rise to different definitions of the fractional derivative depending on how you express your generic function f of x. The exponential formula gives rise to the Liouville definition of the fractional derivative, the sine formula gives rise to the Fourier definition, and the x to the k formula gives rise to the Raymond definition. Let's start by elaborating on the Liouville definition. Suppose I have a nice analytic function f of x that's continuous and differentiable. Suppose that I can express this function as an infinite series with exponential terms, kind of like a Taylor series, but instead of polynomials, I've got exponentials. It's not very common to write a function as a sum of exponentials, but it is possible. Anyway, let's find the fractional derivative of f of x. We'll replace f by the summation here, and use the fact that the derivative of the sum of multiple functions is the sum of their derivatives. We'll use this fact to move the derivative inside the summation. Even though this rule is valid for regular derivatives, keep in mind that it's also valid for fractional derivatives. With this rule, we'll have the sum over k of the a-th derivative of b 
sub k times e to the kx. And since b sub k is a constant, we'll also take that out of the derivative, which is another rule that's valid also for fractional derivatives. Now this a-th derivative of e to the kx is something we've determined previously just up here, and that's k to the a times e to the kx. So therefore, by the Liouville definition, the fractional derivative of f of x, if we express it as an exponential series, is given by the following. Let's now elaborate on the Fourier definition of the fractional derivative. Suppose we again have our function f of x, but now we express it as a sum of a constant b0, a sine series, and a cosine series. Now we can express many analytical functions in terms of sines and cosines. That's the whole point behind Fourier series. So in general, we can write a nice enough function like f of x as the sum of sines and cosines. This is assuming, of course, that f satisfies a couple of other conditions, namely that it's periodic. But using the same kind of algebra we use for the Liouville definition and substituting the fractional derivative of sine, we can write the fractional derivative of f of x according to the Fourier definition as the following. Now note that the fractional derivative of the cosine follows the exact same logic as the fractional derivative of sine. And you can show that on your own as well because they essentially follow the same pattern of derivatives, it's just that it's shifted a little bit. And finally, let's elaborate on the Raymond definition of the fractional derivative. This time we'll write our generic continuous and differentiable function f of x as an infinite series consisting of the sum of polynomial terms, so basically the Taylor series of f of x. Again, if we use the exact same algebra techniques as with the Liouville definition, we can show that the fractional derivative of f of x by the Raymond definition is given by this expression on the right. So now we've formulated three different definitions for the fractional derivative, which depend on how we express our function, whether we express it as a sum of exponentials, a sum of sines and cosines, or a sum of polynomials. In the next video, I'm going to derive a fourth definition called the Caputo definition, and I'm also going to show that these four definitions don't necessarily give you the same answer for the fractional derivative of a function, which will make things quite interesting when we move on to applications of fractional derivatives. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.